Hey, what's going on, guys? Welcome back to your Lake Fort Guide. It's fall and winter, man. That means Alabama rig season. Today, we're going to show you how to do your own thing. We're going to show you how to hand pour custom made swim baits and assemble your own Alabama rigs. Well, as you guys saw on Monday, I'm here with the swim bait master. Oh, one of the better swim bait guys that you'll find really anywhere, but especially right here in East Texas. Heath Taylor, Smash Day Custom Baits. Thank you for taking time out of your day. I know you got lots of baits to make, lots of game wardening to do, and all that good stuff. But hey, Heath is going to show us how to do this today. Now, man, fall and winter, an Alabama rig is about as good a bait as you can rely on day in and day out. Fish get hyper focused on groups of shad. You know, fall is all about schools of fishing. And schools of bass gather up, but they gather around what schools of shad? And there's never been anything in the history of bass fishing that represents the school of shad quite as good as an Alabama. Yeah, and this time of year, shad are moving, bass are following them. Yeah, might as well show them something. It looks like what they're chasing. From our video on Monday, we saw the same thing earlier today when we filmed that, where those fish were literally roaming a big old nine-foot flat, kind of in the middle of nowhere. But boy, were they ganged up around those bait fish. We were able to put those Alabama rigs in there and really go to work on them real good. We caught, if you missed Monday's video, <laughs> stop this, go watch that because we whacked them. I mean, it was uh, any, over. Anytime you're dealing with, with fish that are chasing groups of shad or suspended fish that aren't aren't relating to the bottom or just relating to bait fish, there's nothing better. Nothing better than an Alabama rig. It works really well with the new live sonar technology as well. So, enough of us rambling. I'm going to pull the camera over here, let you guys look over his shoulder. He's going to show you guys, by the way, any of these things that he makes, he makes the best Alabama rig I've ever fished. You're about to see why. Um, but you can find all his stuff at smashtechbaits.com. You can find the swim baits, a lot of them on Tackle Warehouse as well. But you'll be able to find the swim baits, the A-rigs, all that stuff at uh, smashtechbaits.com. All right, and we'll show you all how I make my Alabama rigs. We call them smash rigs because we're smash tech. So, let's start out with... I want a heavier wire than, than you would see it, you know, the ones you can get at, at Walmart or, or Academy. I wanted a heavier wire, that way when you're catching three or four at a time, you can actually just pick up the whole Alabama rig and, and you're not going to break a wire out of the head. You're not going to uh, completely wreck your bait, you know, after catching, you know, three or four fish. We've caught, I think at one time when Mr. Stan was, was with us, I can remember catching over a hundred on, on one rig before it finally got to where we started having to kind of mess with a little bit. So I get these heads and uh, wires made for me. Uh, that's only a quarter ounce. Like I said, I don't want very much weight on my head. I want most of my weight control to be with whatever jig heads or hooks I'm putting on it. So if I want it to go deeper, heavier jig head, I want it to stay shallower, either a like a, a weighted eighth ounce belly swim bait hook or even sometimes just a weightless uh, screw lock swim bait hook. I'll use a lot of that. And if I want it to go deep, you know, you can put on quarter, half ounce jig heads if you're really fishing really, really deep. So that was one of the things I wanted. I didn't want a big, big heavy head. You know, a lot of the, the do-it-yourself kits that you can get will have a really big lead head that you pour. Uh, I didn't want that. So I get these custom made. They're quarter ounce heads with the heavier wire it's about, I mean, about six inch wire and if, if you get a do-it-yourself kit and you have to pour your own head you can actually shave that down yeah you, you could you could take and, and do some work on it and and kind of make it the way you want it but uh this is this is what you start out with so what i will normally do is i'll take and you kind of figure out which ones are positioned in different spots and i'll go ahead and open them up a little bit to where i can work on it so what I'll take first is I'll take, we're going to build an eight blade right now. And you'll, you're about to see why, besides all the components for, costing for, costing a lot of money, you're going to figure out why they why they cost a little bit of money because they're, they're tedious to, to put together and kind of time consuming. 
when you say a blade, you're talking about the little willow blades that come on the arms of the rigs. Most people are going to know what you're talking about, but for those that don't, Correct. there's little willow blades that go on the arms. That's kind of the modern way to do it. When they first started, none of them had blades. Now they kind of all do, right? Yeah, when, so. when the Alabama rig first kind of hit the hit the bass fishing scene, nobody had blades. Now I will not throw one without at least four blades. But I really like the eight blade ones. I feel like the more flash, the better. There's times that you know you probably get get the four blade and it'd be fine in like super clear water but especially in a little bit off colored water I feel like the more flash the more vibration the better so we put these little sleeves on and I know by doing so many where I need to put them so I can use my finger as a as a guide I've got and you've got to crimp these little sleeves on at just the right height I use a pair of cutters. They sell crimpers, but I found that I like cutters. If you just got to be careful that you don't squeeze too hard, or you will cut the wire because these are really sharp cutters. If you do that, it's time to put the first set of blades on. And I, I buy the blades like all these components you buy separate. So you buy the blade separate. Buy some good quality blades, willow leaf, small willow leaf blades. Then you have to have a split ring, then you have to have a swivel. Then you also have to have, for each one, you have to have a clevis. So you take your clevis, and then your swivel with your blade. Can you show me one of the clevises? You can see it right there. It's just like a spinnerbait clevis. Mm -hmm. Okay. And one of those will go on each arm. So now that you got one on each of the four outside arms you have to put four more of these sleeves back on and then we're just gonna crimp those the same way you crimp the mm -hmm. that the way you, you keep your do you want any gap in there or do you want those to be tight you don't the... want them you don't want them completely down against them because what would happen if I was to have it completely against it that's not gonna spin freely very well so what you have to do is I pull it up just a little and then crimp it. Gotcha. So leave just ever so just slight leave of a gap. There. Like a 30 second to 16th gap to where your blades can spin. Where that clevis can, can rotate on that, that wire. So then since we're making since we're making an eight blade, you gotta put four more, one on each one. Same process over again. What do you use to space them out? Uh, I've done it so many times. I know how far I want it to be. You look like you're you're giving it about an inch and a half there, give or take. So where I hold it in my hand and, and to the end of my finger, I hold it the same way just about every time. So I kind of know where I want. So we basically repeat the process that we just did with the first set of blades with our second set of four blades. So now what I'll normally do is I'll kind of look at it make sure it all looks about right. Now this part if you don't have the right kind of wire bending tool this is almost impossible. Uh, you can't really with this thick of wire you can't do this with with pliers very effectively at all it's just it's not gonna work so you take this first part and you make your make your loop and I've got it about halfway between where the, where the blade is and the end and that one looks like it's about an, maybe an inch inch and a quarter below the and then you've got your you've got your middle arm that you haven't done anything to it stays naked I guess you'd say but you do the same thing to it and that makes your loops to where you can put your snaps now a lot of the snaps hold that up let me see real quick hold it up okay yeah. so that makes your loops for your snaps like I said without this tool right here, it's almost impossible. 
Let me see the snaps. You got a snap and a yeah. swivel there. Now these these are coast heavy duty coast lock snaps. They're ninety pound coast lock snaps. I use I use a little heavier than than like the ones you'll go to Walmart or somewhere and buy. They're they're going to straighten out a lot on you. Like when we caught you caught three at a time. If you'd have had you know cheaper swivels, chances are right. You might have. I was going to say I think yeah. that. Uh, of course, the the gauge of the wire has to be right. But other than that, I mean, that's the most important part of the rig is those snaps because that's what's connecting your hook, your fish, to the rig, and what has to take the most abuse. And that was one. That was the most probably one of the most frustrating things when I first started throwing Alabama rigs. You know, buying them off the shelf was, you know, you'd you'd hook what you knew you had two or three fish on. Well, all of a sudden you'd lose one. You'd come out and the swivel snap would, snap would, would be, it'd mm-hmm. be completely opened up. Fish would be gone because they were just so so light they don't put the heavy ones on there well an important point to mention here is that the other alabamers you can buy with heavy duty snaps as good as these they're going to cost you 30 plus dollars yeah they're very very expensive so, so that was another reason I started and, and your those. alabama rigs are retailing for me where from like 17 to 20 17 19 yeah, right right in that range which is obviously you know two-thirds of the cost of the others that have the same quality snaps yeah on and it. i like i said i don't do it to, to make a ton of money these are time consuming and tedious i just do it because I wanted a better Alabama rig that I didn't have to spend an arm and leg on, and I know other people do too. So, so when you make that little loop, you put your put your swivel in there, your your snap, then you've got to lay it down in this little spe- special wire bender, and that's what spins the wire around itself. Now to be able to try to do that with with pliers is, like I said, it, it's basically Let impossible. Me see this real quick. So now basically you got to take and do that little yep, twisty loop de loop. You got to do that we'll, we'll do four more times. Yeah, we'll do it again. Just take work that in that little groove. It's got a little slot that everything sits in. You spin it until it wraps around itself. And that locks the, the snap in place. And now we've got yep all those are on and done. Now we've got a very professionally made. Very durable, outstanding, custom-made Alabama rig, just like that. Yep. That'll last you a lot of fish, or if you get it hung in a brush pile, which I think uh, I think you you were talking uh, the other night on one of your one of your podcasts with live sonar. We don't lose near as many. Of these right, because you can see where the brush pile is. Yeah. That's right. Because you can keep it over the top of stuff, so you don't lose near as many. And I and I did notice. When I was throwing the single hook today, that it would almost bounce off of things because you didn't have all these hooks out here to grab things when you were running it through. Because I opened mine up a little bit more, I opened them up you know, about like this. Well, I was basically protecting. It's like four giant weed guards. Yeah, I was basically protecting this hook, so I was able to run it against you know some stumps that were out there, and you could feel it just kind of deflect off the stumps. Mm. And because uh, your hook, the only hook I, we have on that that one is right here, and it's protected. Like you said, it's basically like having four weed guards. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of a kind of a neat deal. Well, that's a great looking a rig. Let's go make some custom hand pour swim baits to uh, add on to that thing. What I always do, whether I'm using if I'm using these silicone molds, what I'll do is I will take some scrap leftover plastic, I'll melt it down, and I'll pour it into these silicone molds. And it does two things, uh, and I don't hear a lot of people talk about it, but it'll do two things. If these have been sitting for a few days and not being used, you're going to get, you know, little pieces of dirt and, and junk might fall in there. Well, it cleans all the, the leftover dirt or anything that might be, and I might have gotten in these molds. If you pour some just scrap plastic in there, let it cool, pull it out. It's going to clean those molds completely. They're going to be ready to go. Plus, it's going to warm. The inside of these molds up that way whenever you start pouring your your baits they're going to bond better yep. than pouring into a you know if it's especially you know out here in the shop right now it's you know 73 degrees mm-hmm. well if, if the molds are cold it's going to make your plastic cool way quicker than you want it to especially in the small areas of you're not going to get the same, same yep. quality of pour you're, you're i used to do the same thing when i custom made jigs before I put hooks into the jig molds, I would run hot melted lead through there three or four times, dump it out three or four times, remelt the lead, just to get the the mold hot. Once the mold's hot, it's going to form the the bait or the jig head in that case a lot better. 
Yep. Always, always. And if you're using, like you're hand pouring in a in an open pour, these are all injection molds, but if you're hand pouring in an open aluminum mold, I heat them up on a hot plate or like a big griddle. I've got an old griddle that I'll, I'll set them on there and I'll heat them up. So what do we got here? All right, basically this is this is plastic saw. I buy it in, in 55 gallon drums and when I get it, I mix it up and I, I pour it into one gallon jugs just because it's easier to work with. So plastic saw is the material we're using mm -hmm. here. We're just gonna pour that in there and then you add color after. That's the way I do it. I take, and we're gonna do it the old school style of using old Pyrex cups. Pyrex cups and microwaves. And we started doing it that way years ago and we still do a lot of it that way. Two minutes and 30 seconds? Uh, that's ballpark, it'll, it'll probably be, it'll possibly be a little bit longer than that. But it, it's always better to have to add time than burn it. Because this stuff, one, it's expensive, Two, it's if you burn it, it's extremely bad to breathe in. It's it's not good to breathe in, you know, really well anyway. But if you burn it, it's very toxic. So you don't want to burn it. So less is more. But you want to get it up to about 350. And uh, used to I would use a an infrared temperature gun, but I've done it so long that I usually just go by feel, well, the way it feels and the way it stirs and the way it looks. I can pretty well tell that that it's gotten up to temperature and it's, it's where it needs to be. Okay, so now we've got the plastic saws hot. My man's stirring it. He, yeah, it's hot, but it's You not, want it to get to what, 350? You want it to get about 350. It's probably not quite 350 right now, but it's it's already done. It's changed to where it's, it's, it's clear. Gone, it's gone from looking like milk to, to, clear. to crystal clear. So I can go ahead. This is going to be the top, the back color. So I can go ahead and add some coloring to it. What color are we going to be pouring? Uh, just a basic shad color. What color is that you're adding in there? I use, it's it's called uh, Minnow Silver from uh, from Lurecraft. Minnow Silver with a little bit of what? Black? A little bit of black. Minnow Silver with a little bit of black. I'm going to stir it up. And it gives you a Kind of a really nice a gray sheen, silver yeah, sheen. With some with some sparkle to it. It's got a that minnow silver has tons and tons of tiny, tiny silver flake. I don't know if you can see that in the Oh yeah, yeah it's showing up. It's tiny, tiny silver flake in there. Okay. So I can put that back in. Grab our belly color. And it probably needs just a little bit longer. You can see still see some white in it. Yeah, it's not quite as clear. Mm -hmm. So it's not quite as warm as... Not quite ready for color yet. We'll stick it in for just a little bit longer. If you notice the, the shop, this is, this is what your shop looks like when you're in the middle of about six or seven type of warehouse orders and a bunch of other store orders. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. You don't have time to clean. That's right. Ain't nobody got time for that. You ain't got time to clean, so... Smell like they was barbecuing. You just, yeah, you just keep making baits. You can clean. Speaking of barbecue, we just ate barbecue. We didn't eat barbecue. <laughs> it's right there. There's the barbecue. Hmm? <laughs> Not too bad. Did we get it clear enough? It's almost there, so we're going to go ahead and add some color. Add the color, which on this basic shad color, what I like to do is just take it's Lurecraft, it's just pearl white powder. And you don't add. Just a lot of it. I've got six ounces of, of plastic saw. And I'll do like an eighth of a eighth of a teaspoon of that pearl white powder. Mix it up real good because it gives you that kind of still almost transparent. Mm -hmm. Stir it up real good, and I'll put it back in there one last time. check this one because you want to keep the key is you want to keep this hot but you don't want to scorch it and burn it so what we're going to do to get this one ready to pour for our set our back color while we're pouring that one we're going to bump this one again again for another 30 seconds or so 
while you're pouring that one while I'm pouring that one if we're doing like just little small batches like this it's not that big a deal because we have time to, to really time it but a lot of times I'll have I might have every set of mold I have out here that I'm going to do in that color I might have 30 or 40 molds out here doing different sets well I might be juggling you know three or four mm -hmm. microwaves trying to make sure that I get everything done you know especially if you're doing like a three color bait We've got our belly color warm enough. Feels right, looks right. Yeah. And I guess uh, you know I could do the, the safe thing. Kids, now, kids, kids at home wear gloves. Now what are we gonna do? We got these little swim bait molds for the baby coaches. We got these little baby molds. What I like to do, some people like to stop before the tail. I will go ahead and continue into the tail. That's just the way I started doing it years ago, and that's the way I kept doing it. Some people will like to stop before the tail, but I will fill the molds. Well, like, you're being really slow and methodical with how you're pouring that. Like too. these, these all go up to about the middle of the eye sockets. Y'all can see in there where the eye sockets are. That's what he's looking at to judge how much he pours for the bottom for the bottom half of the bait. And that's when you're just doing a two-color bait. When I'm doing a three-color bait, I'll I'll kind of do a little bit less because that second that middle accent color is going to take up a little bit. Being real careful. That's that's one thing to note if you're learning how to do this is just how methodical he's being when he's pouring these. The the more precise you are when you're pouring them, the less you have to do as far as trimming and stuff like that. So what you're going to do is while that's kind of cooling, you're going to check this. Check this, see what the consistency is. You want to make sure. And if you don't know what you're doing, use the 350 yeah, degree use, mark. Use an infrared thermometer. And what I will really like to, I really like to do is on a, a two color bait there's a line you want to walk i want to get it actually 370 ish because you can get it to 370 once and then pour your back color and it'll really help it to, to bond together but if you try to keep it or reheat it to 370 or higher more than once you're, you're going to start, start overcooking you're going to start overcooking and yellowing your plastic but i like for if i'm just doing like the initial run i want it to be hotter so it really, really, especially like these small little tail areas, mm -hmm. to where it's going to bond because these these tail areas like to uh, cool off quicker. So what I'll do, and you've got to be careful. And it's just the way I've always done it, just to kind of check stuff. Is you if you blow on it, you see how it's still kind of liquid, but it won't really move too much yet. You want it to be soft, but not completely liquid. And what I'll do is I'll start at the tail. You mean soft but not completely solid? Well, not completely liquid and not completely solid. To where it almost it tries, like yeah, it up. almost tries to mix right there in that middle part. And if you're careful like mm. that, you won't have to do much trimming mm. when you're done. That was smooth, dude, right there. And like this is just a, a basic simple color. We did. You can see on that one where it tried to mix a little mm -hmm. bit in the middle. See, but if you're if you're quick enough, you can run over to the side and kind of catch it. Like I would rather pour it a little too soon than waiting too late because you can trap it like that. It's not going to uh, mix into the belly color too much. So I kind of try to surround that middle soft part. But I always start at the tail and work my way forward and kind of push the plastic up. What's the cooling time on this once we've poured it like this? You know, the diff different sized molds are different. Uh, 
this one will take kind of the bigger the longer yeah the bigger the bigger and fatter they are the longer they're going to take if there's if there's a hook slot in there they're going to cool quicker because it dissipates some of the heat kind of sucks the heat out but these are just solid little solid swim baits how do you know when they're ready same way like i'll, I'll look at them either you can kind of wiggle them a little bit or you can kind of blow on them and you see it move mm -hmm. if it still moves that's it means it's not ready it's not ready cool whenever you start to kind of touch this and it, it, it doesn't move like i said you're seeing it wiggle mm -hmm. and move like like still fluid when it starts looking less like jello and more like a swim bait basically and when i'm when i'm having to pour like a little tip especially if you're pouring just like a little handful set of molds i would take when i used to do it on a smaller scale get like a little small table fan just a little bitty one and i would set it right next to the to the molds and let it blow over the top of them and it would speed up the process a, a, a lot quicker you would be able to demold your baits quicker but Sweet. usually when i'm doing it now i'm wanting them to take longer because i've got a set of molds i'm doing here a set of molds i'm doing here so i might have 20 30 molds i don't really need them to cool any quicker because by the time i'm done with these molds these over here are can you leave them in there long like if you pour you can, you can leave them if you want to pour a batch of 10 swim baits and you pour your swim baits and you just leave them in there and go get them the next morning before you go fishing that's fine absolutely fine. can't leave them in there too long because i'm gonna mess them up okay just want to make sure now on, on an open pour it's, it's now there's like some injection molds if you leave them a long time and let them cool, sometimes you'll get dense. Mm. But stuff like this, open pores like these, no problem. You can leave them overnight, come back, okay. get them, slap eyes on them, go fishing with them. All right, we got them cooled off. Yeah, all right, they've cooled for, oh, what, five minutes? Five minutes. Yeah. So you can take and pull that off, and it doesn't. No more Jello wiggle. Doesn't move. It's still, it's still a little soft. You can take, reach in the mold, pull it out. Good. It's still still hot, still uh okay, a little custom pour still shad soft, a little shad swim bait. What I like to do, I'll give them a little bath. Let them kind of solidify them a little better. Let them cool off. That'll cool the, the inside of them. So when I'm doing a bunch of them, I'm trying to get them out of the mold as quick as I can. Yeah, I've walked in when y'all are in the middle of pouring and this little yeah, trough little, here is just like full of baits. That whole thing, you know, I can remember having 300 and something convicts in that thing at a time. <laughs> That's a lot. That would raise the water level in that trough. So I toss them in there, let them sit for, usually I'll let them sit for quite a while, sometimes overnight. If I'm, you know, no, I'm not going to fish with them or anything. And, it, and it's really best if, if you do pour swim baits to not pour them and then run right out and go fish them because the plastic needs it really needs at least 24 hours to cure like completely at the minimum because it's still going to be a little soft it's probably going to tear on you if you don't let it have at least about a day to cure all right like say if you're if you're not swim baits cooled off we got some jig heads on our a-rig let's put together the final product and show the folks at home what we're working with yeah this is this is a baby poacher. You can use these on, on the A-Rig. Or you can use hollow bodies. You can use any swim bait you want. Basically, just like any other swim bait, you're just going to want to kind of measure where your hook's going to come out. And on something really fat like this bait, I want to kind of stay in the top third of the bait. I'm going to make sure it goes in there it's up and those barbs will kind of keep it on get you a, get you a swim bait hook that has either barb keepers or screw lock keepers and that's gonna you will suck right up in there got four more to go finished product hold it up put it up here in front of you let me see looks like a baby's mobile toy of bass fishing goodness so these are uh hmm. beefy looks pretty awesome or yeah, if you wanted to, you just hang these. If you wanted to, you could just hang these from uh, hang these from your baby's uh, in front of your baby's crib. Yeah, uh, you might if they can stand up. I take the hooks off though. Probably want to crimp those hooks off or something into the plastic. Maybe, maybe not. They got to learn same way they learn the stove side, right? Here we go. 
Man, that's a great looking Alabama rig. There you go, guys. Top to bottom, how you custom build your own Alabama rig made out of just raw components that you can order that anybody can order. How you custom hand pour swim baits out of raw materials that anybody can order. And there's different molds out there. Find a swim bait mold you like. You can hand pour them and do up whatever color swim baits you want. But whatever you do, get your hands on some quality Alabama rigs, just like the Smash rig from uh, SmashTechBase.com. Get your hands on some quality swim baits like the Baby Poacher from SmashTechBase.com. And definitely find those schools of bait and throw an Alabama rig this following winter. Won't hurt. In case you missed, here's a like as many fish catches as I can fit in 15 seconds. Clear that for me, Taylor. That's pretty dang awesome. This one right here in the middle is a daggum. Give me a little fish bump. Mm. Here you Boy, the Garmin live. Oh, baby Gary's catching them. Yeah, you're gonna want to do that. Go ahead and get you one of these and then go do some of that. Heath Taylor, thank you so much as always, my man, for taking the time. I know you're a busy guy. Thank you guys, more importantly, for watching. As always, go check out smashtagbase.com. In fact, there's a bunch of links down there. There's a whole bunch of links down there. We got new toys, so what y'all need to do is those links are down there. Y'all need to get to clicking. I'm gonna grab that and get back to fishing, and we'll see you next time right here on your Lake Fort Guide. Folks, the video's over. Go home. Why are you still watching? There's nothing happening here. <laughs> We're not even fishing anymore. We're still catching fish, though.